This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 785, recorded on Wednesday, August 5th, 2020. Why are lemurs? Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight we will fill your head with happier cows, spinny sperm, and toxic webs. But first, thanks to the Burroughs Welcome Fund and our Patreon sponsors for their generous support of Twists. You can become a part of the Patreon community at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The following program might be considered politically biased because it is almost entirely science-based. We have not taken time to include the other side arguments. The world is round, knowing full well that there's still a robust argument amongst a few individuals somewhere around the world who have a different view of how the universe works. We will talk as if global warming is real and man-made and getting worse, despite the politicians with ties to the fossil fuel industry not being entirely convinced. We will talk about extinct life forms, ancient DNA, and evolution, without explaining that most of the world still entertains cartoonish children's stories as their origin. And we will talk about the very real threat from a pandemic virus. We will not allow anyone here to call it a hoax, not when there is now one American death every 80 seconds from COVID-19. Wear a mask, wash your hands, stay home, or better yet, head for the hills and don't ever plan on coming back. Whatever you decide, remember that if we all just took the drastic step of doing nothing together for just three weeks, we would be done with it. Instead, we're just beginning another episode of This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. to you kiki and blair and a good science to you too justin blair and everyone out there welcome to another episode of this week in science we're back we're here we have the science we do and we have a scientist who's joined us for the evening it's going to be very exciting tonight on the show I have stories about spinny sperms and also new natural protection for multiple sclerosis and limits to our brain. Tonight, we're going to be joined by Dr. Lydia Green, who will be talking to us about lemurs. It's going to be very thrilling. Justin, what did you bring? Interesting. I've got the body of an athlete, just not sure what sport it's suited to yet. Uh, Juno discovering activity on Jupiter and better mouse memories. You have better mouse memories? Hmm. Yeah. Better than bitter mouse memories. Blair, what's in the animal corner? I have those too. I actually have a few of those too. <laughs> um, I have cows. I have frog vents. And I also have bad pandas. Frog events? <laughs> are there are there ever any good pandas in Blair's Animal Corner? I, oh, I think panda. if we took a, a look back through the past, probably not. Yeah. No. It's yeah. always bad pandas. Yeah. I think we I think we should have a twist sticker or t shirt or something. I think you need to make some art, Blair. The bad panda art. Is that like bad wolf? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it'll be good. Start writing it everywhere. It could be good. Oh, as we jump into the show, I would like to remind all of you that subscribing to Twist will bring you Twist every single week. Right? It's a subscription to sciencey goodness. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, or just about any place podcasts are found. Look for this week in science. Or head to our website, twistwis.org. It's now time for the quick science stories. Let me start us off with some Martian ice sheets. I've got so much sibilance right there. That's kind of crazy. Ice sheets from Mars. Yes. 
using an algorithm taking into account erosion processes. Researchers at the University of British Columbia and their collaborators analyzed over 10 thousand Martian valleys and compared them to subglacial channels in the Canadian Arctic archipelago, they found similarities that led them to a new hypothesis that no, there never were any free-flowing rivers on Mars. None of that watery, rivery surface. Mm -mm -mm -mm. No, these river-like channels that are seen on the surface of Mars today were formed by meltwaters beneath ice sheets, like those that used to cover much of the Earth. The idea would be even huh. more supportive of life on Mars, as thick ice sheets would protect microbial life from radiation. From radiation, provide, yeah. Yeah, and provide a kind of constant environment for them to live in. So huh. ice sheets, that's the new idea now. What say you? Are you sad? This yeah, I like this idea. <laughs> no, well, well you, uh, because then what you have, is, especially under a melting glacial thing, is you have uh, ponds, you have subglacial uh, waterways, you have you have you have actually kind of a ro very robust. And then, as you just point out in the beginning there, which uh, yeah, the protection from radiation, which would have been crucial for Earth-like uh, life to to have survived there. Uh, would also be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Because Mars has never really been known for having a big magnetic field to protect anything on its surface from solar radiation. Earth has a lovely magnetic field, which we say thank you to every day. Thank you for protecting me, magnetic field. I mean, I do, don't you? Oh, Justin, tell me about that athletic potential of yours. Will you be leaping across the surface of Mars? Well, you know, so this is the thing. Like, I have always felt like I am an athlete. I just never found a sport that I'm good at. Uh, but there may be help on the way. This is, uh, this is a new paper by University of South Australia sports scientist, Professor Grant Tompkinson. Uh, he analyzes how a, a new portable kind of cheap, I think it's like 8000 bucks, 3D whole body scanner can spot athletic talents. Uh, also monitoring changes in bodies over time. So this is a, a field called anthropometry. Anthropo, anth I'm not sure where to put the emphasis. It has been used for, for a long time to identify talent. It's used for this very thing. Improve performance in athletes and check their health and that sort of thing. But it's usually done with uh, different kinds of scans, even x-rays. With this, uh, according to Professor Tomkinson, uh, 3D scanning is less invasive than manual tests. And because it is fast, large samples can be easily measured. There is no need for physical contact. It doesn't require a lot of expertise to run the machinery. And it can measure body surface areas and volumes. Unlike x-rays, it doesn't, of course, emit any harmful radiation. Uh, for this particular test, uh, there was 49 athletes, 30 women and 19 men. They subjected them to a series of 35 second long scans and got millions of measurements within two millimeters of accuracy about their different body configurations. And so what they're doing is they're basically finding people who are already really good athletes in their fields and sort of figuring out what makes what is the what are the measurements that make a good long distance runner versus somebody who can uh, lift a lot of weight or, or whatever the whatever their athletic skill might already be but uh but yeah but 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 that doesn't take into account muscle fibers and short the the fast twitch versus slow twitch fibers and what well it does it though fibers doesn't in though. The like what so so if you think about it i mean and it, this was a lot of like sort of what i've looked at, at this too was like well how much information are you actually getting out of there they're looking for small things they're looking for asymmetries is something as big as scoliosis, one leg being longer than the other, arm lengths overall in terms of giving reach. But Don't then tell the me density, that my crooked spine can't do a backbend. No. I, no, 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 no. Just <laughs> maybe not in the Olympics. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, all right. Didn't mean to break that bubble. But you, I, I would think that you could tell perhaps that the different twitchy muscles based on how they lay upon the leg. I mean, uh, the that 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 mm -hmm. sort of bulky calf muscle is probably more of a lifter's muscle than a runner's long distance runner's muscle or a sprinter's muscle more than a long distance muscle. So there may you may be able to sort of see that because they, uh, especially they say marathon runners have very defined physiques. 
shorter, yes. lighter, longer legs relative to their, to their torso. And then they're saying they can also track changes in, in whole body and lean mass using this scanning. I mean, you're not going to replace the combine event in the NFL where they're putting people through the leaping and the running who's fast. And who, it's not really going to replace any of that. I could sort of see it being used as a training skill. But I do like the idea that you could use it to tell what type of athlete body you most resemble. So you could be like, oh, I might get, you know, get a little printout. It's like, oh, I should invest some time playing badminton because apparently I have a badminton athlete's body. I didn't know. Haven't been playing well hard enough. I should go. Now that's what I should go try doing because maybe there's, I'm better suited to it. There's, this is also a part of this to not work out, right? Exactly. Like, uh, well, yeah. you know, I'd go for a run, but I did a 3D body scan. It turns out I'm just not a runner. Just, just not, not a runner. runner. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's it's reminding me very much of those career aptitude tests that are given to you in high school mm -hmm. and they tell you yeah. what you're going to be what, mm -hmm. you know, based on your skill in high school, your your knowledge in high school, you're going to be a secretary. You're going to be, you know, an astronaut. None of the options Mine, in that to... test ended up being science communicator. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. None of those Can options were you? available. Can I tell you what my top two were? Can I? T I remember this test because yeah. it led to a summer job. My top two were scientist and actor. That's great. <laughs> those my were the, two those were, were <laughs> um, park ranger or chef. You're right. Oh, you feed animals. You're right the in zoo. there too. That's okay, right there. so it was accurate for you, not for me. <laughs> I was never very good at tests. Oh. <laughs> We're well, not never supposed to be good at the test. You're just supposed to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> what did it tell you, Kiki? <laughs> I don't even remember. I looked at Martial it. Martial artist. Threw it. <laughs> like, that oh, says nothing about me. Not I think it said, you should go in the army. And I was like, no. Oh. No. no just because I'm violent no. doesn't mean I want. <laughs> It's totally different. Totally I just want to throw inanimate objects across a room and scream. I just want to kick when they don't work. Shins. No. No. <laughs> you could see that on the body scan, right? Oh, that's yeah. 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 <laughs> you can see the lumps on my on my shins. <laughs> According to our test, you work with somebody who has a temper. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It'll be interesting to see where this goes, whether it's more than, you know, so many of these kind of, you know, IQ tests, um, you know, these very, gen I don't know, they're trying to do very specific stuff, but is it really going to tell potential or it, will it be more used as a tool for refinement? You know, yeah. potentially as a, as a slight disclaimer, uh, or the caveat to this, I have seen a lot of commercials for some sort of like, instead of having a healthcare system, just walk into this body scanner. It tells you everything you need to know. No, it won't. Uh, it's not good like that yet. Uh, it's not taking any blood samples. It's running a little bit of electricity to your body and going, oh, you may, it's testing your heart rate. Like, that's fine. But that's not really uh, replacing your doctor anytime soon. Uh, but yeah. the timing of this uh, coming out and that being uh, popularized or advertised kind of makes it a little, to me, a little bit suspicious that this is coming out right now. This may, I mean, I just. Science by press release. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Science by press release a little bit. Yeah. Maybe. But There's no results technology. to this. Didn't say like, it was just, it's like, hey, maybe we can look at. Maybe it'll just help, you know, our, our genes fit better in the future I don't know. no but that, that's actually probably one of the highest best uses yeah no this is absolutely true a, a hip leg butt scan before oh. you like buy a pair and then of jeans you print your jeans there you go yeah oh well, yeah or just order off Those the rack that with really are design. skin tight <laughs> yeah no this for tailors <laughs> this is like probably yeah and then you can you walk into your body scan you have that recorded Depending on how much you fluctuate, you go back with more or less frequency. And then you can order your clothes online, custom fit, because they've all been tailored to you. That's probably the best use of this technology. Yeah, I think so. Could make us happier in the future shopping. But Blair, what's going to make cows happier? 
Um, well, I don't know, but I do have a study related to how we can tell if they're happy or not. <laughs> So um, we know that cows actually are social creatures. A lot of people don't realize that, but people who study cows certainly know that. And that they have complex social relationships that change and the group dynamics constantly evolve. So a team of Chilean and U.S. scientists spent 30 days observing a small herd of dairy cows that had recently given birth to understand a part of their, a particular part of their bovine interactions, um, which is social grooming behavior, also known as allo grooming. And the reason this is kind of so important to look at is because you don't just throw a bunch of cows together on a field and call it a day. In dairy production systems, they're constantly shuffled into different groups depending on their lactation stage, nutrition requirements, where they are in breeding, etc. And every time they do that, they have to reestablish their social structure. So knowing how to kind of read their behavior, know if they're adapting to their new social structure well or not is really important because a, a happier cow is a healthier cow and a healthier cow definitely makes better food products and will live longer and will have more babies, et cetera, et cetera. So by looking at this, they looked at over 1300 aloe grooming events from 38 cows during this month long experiment. And they found a lot of different behaviors and um, patterns of those behaviors. They looked at things like animal age and social rank. And they found, for example, that cows tend to groom individuals that had previously groomed them, stuff we've talked about with other animals, so a, a mutual cooperation. But they also tended to prefer individuals of a similar age, suggesting familiarity from growing up together or just recognizing their similar age. I don't know, some other reason. Um, and then they also found that older individuals groomed more cows than younger ones. So allo grooming could be also related to seniority in some way. So all of this to say they could actually look at how the grooming was happening, how often it was happening and who was doing the grooming to uh, kind of draw conclusions about if the group was acclimating well after a, a kind of a remixing or not and move forward, therefore. So um, they know that this is something that could be used in the future for farmers to monitor the social aspects of cows and the emotional relationships within their group. And if they are able to see that cows are grooming each other, that means that they are getting along. But if grooming declines, that could be a sign of impaired welfare. And that is a great opportunity to check, make sure nobody's sick, nobody's not getting along, maybe check your stress hormones. There's lots of things you could do, right? Once you kind of recognize that there's this trigger. So um, I just wanted to bring this story because I think it's important for us to think where our food comes from. If you're a vegetarian or not, you might still drink milk. If you're a vegan, you might, I don't know, still wear leather or use other products that benefit from livestock in some way. And um, it's important for us to understand their social structures because that can mm -hmm. help us take better care of them. <laughs> I didn't know. Uh, I didn't know that uh, cows engaged in this social grooming behavior. Yeah, I've never yeah. noticed it. And, and it, that cows is the reason around. I brought the story. I think it's uh, a yeah. lot of people don't know how complex cow social structure is. I don't have to just watch drive by them on Highway Five and see them sitting around. I think that's mm -hmm. it. Moo. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Think of think of the moo cows, but you don't think yeah. about them as individuals, as a group, how they get along with each other. That's right. They're social animals, so it's yeah. It's not, it's not they are. I have noticed that they do cluster, even if they have like mm -hmm. a ton of room to go wander around. They will all sort of hang out together in whatever patch of uh, if they like each other. They're in. But I guess my local cows are very, very well adapted to each mm -hmm. other. They, I they think Davis cows are, are on on the whole. They're they're moo cows. They're 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 happy cows. They're pretty happy. <laughs> I mean, they really like to the point where I've also sometimes like spread out. What are you doing? There's like all of this acreage you have here and they're all like clustered up right next to each other. Like the what some of them are like pinned in, like even if they wanted to go for a walk, they're not going anywhere. They're stuck. Speaking of happiness, let's talk about sperm. Always. Sperm. Always. Always. When you think of sperm, you think of that little flapping flagella going from side to side, swimming the sperm toward their final destination, mm -hmm. death or egg. Death apparently, though, <laughs> apparently, it's though, it's almost always death. Yeah, almost, almost mostly <laughs> death. Yes. But apparently sperm don't really swim. We've had the wrong idea for basically as long as we've had microscopes. 
So stop. Oh. What? <laughs> yes. They spin. No. Sperm spin. No. <laughs> yes. What? So there's a new investigation. Yes. Of sperm motility. The motion of sperm. Determined that we what we saw is the side to side motion <gasps> was actually an optical illusion because we were looking at sperm as a 2D image through a microscope. It's like a corkscrew into a bottle of wine. Is that what you're saying? Yes. So <laughs> the instead of flopping back and forth, what happens is this, the head of the sperm spins like a top. <laughs> and then to compensate for the spinning of the top, the flagella actually has a lopsided f- movement that only it's asymmetrical. It only moves to one side. But because the the sperm body is spinning, the movement of the flagella appears to be going back and forth. So but it do they doesn't. all spin in the same direction? Oh. Yes, I think they do. But I think that when they don't spin in the same direction, they don't do as well. <laughs> I don't know. Does, Actually, does this it, is a really interesting question. Does it depend on the hemisphere? <laughs> 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 or do yes. all Although animals the have the same spinning sperm? I think that... Isn't that, the hemisphere just? Also. Yeah, I thought the hemisphere came down to who designed the toilets. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah, I was making a bad joke. <laughs> yeah, but no. Uh, <laughs> Which I always welcome. Yes. So wait, where, and now I'm confused at the propulsion. Like, what's moving the spinning if it's not the flagellity thing? But the flagella is, it, is it, moving. There it's are part of that two... propulsion. It's just cork. Yes. So it's like a corkscrew. It's like they're they're like corkscrewing through the fluid, right? Is that yes. It's yeah. like a spinning top, like a it's corkscrew. kind of viscous fluid. So it's like mm-hmm. so it's wow. they drill. If you could imagine <gasps> um if you've ever used a drill that has the handle on it that you spin around the mm-hmm. the drill bit. Um mm-hmm. that's kind of the way I think of it and how they're moving, but they move in three dimensional space as opposed to just this wow. two dimensional back and forth movement. And they have this, and it's all rotational. Today will go down in history as the day I learned <laughs> that sperm spin. I'm never going to forget it. it. I think this understanding could affect so much understanding of sperm motility and mm-hmm. um, issues with infertility. Yeah, sperm competition. And like Lydia brought up the, uh, you know, if there are sperm that swim in different directions, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. You know, is, uh, you know, what are, how are the molecules set up within the sperm for the molecular motor to move? And how does that affect yeah. how they, how they perform? And, and also yeah, how they fertilize. The- and how they mm-hmm. fertilize, yeah. How they fertilize, and I picture make, now it makes me picture them like uh, like how the NASCAR cars all get really close to each other for drag. Like if if they are like not agreeing on a direction, do they not make it as far? That little that little group, like they, 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 are they working against each other, sending little turbulences mm-hmm. if they're not spinning the same way, if they're not working as a team initially, at least. Like ducks flying, and like the one in the lead <laughs> has to like go to the back. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's fascinating. And and it really, yeah, you're right, Justin. What does it mean for turbulence? And how do they mm-hmm. deal with that? Oh, mm-hmm. this has so many layers of complexity now that I never, ever considered. Sperm, so complex. They spin. All right, tell me about Jupiter, Justin. Oh, yeah. So there was activ- there's activity on uh, Jupiter that we weren't aware of before. This is NASA's Jupiter orbiting spacecraft, Juno. Uh, sparking new questions about the gas giant is it unexpectedly discovered lightning in the planet's upper atmosphere. Uh, this is published in August uh, 5th, which is, I guess, today. Journal Nature, Jupiter's gaseous atmosphere seems placid from the distance, but up close, clouds royal in a turbulent, chemically dynamic realm, according to the, this research paper. Yeah, uh, this is, uh, this is, who am I quoting? Jonathan Lunin. Professor of Physical Sciences and Chair of the Department of Astronomy at Cornell University. On the night side of Jupiter, you see fairly frequent flashes, as if you are above an active thunderstorm on Earth. You get these tall columns and anvils of clouds, and the lightning is going continuously. We can get some pretty substantial lightning here on Earth, and the same is true for Jupiter. So 
previously, Voyager 1, Galileo, New Horizons had all observed lightning of some form going on uh, on Jupiter. But they couldn't really tell. It looked like it was coming from deep down inside. Juno has uh, a, a camera that is designed to detect much dimmer sources of light. Uh, and it's also just sort of more able to uh, tightly control its focus as, as opposed mm-hmm. to its, its resolution and, and sort of depth of field than the others. And yeah, discovered lightning where we actually didn't expect it to be possible. And what they think is happening is that there's ammonia that is in the upper atmosphere. <clears throat> there's water and other elements there as well, but they would normally freeze this far out from the this core of this uh, gas giant. They would be expected to be frozen, but if there's enough ammonia there, It keeps uh, the freezing from taking place, and therefore you can continue to have this electric activity taking place. So, cool. Something we didn't know. This is uh, also Yuri Aglamov, who is a a postdoctoral candidate at Cornell, uh, saying, Shallow lightning hadn't really been expected and indicates that there's an unexpected process causing it. It's one more way in which Juno's observations show a much more complex atmosphere of Jupiter than had been predicted. We know enough now to ask the right questions about the processes going on there. But as Juno shows, we're in a stage where every answer also tends to multiply the questions. Mm, Juno nothing. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) I couldn't help myself. (laughs) What I think is amazing is we've seen Jupiter, you know, we've had images of Jupiter, the great red spot, all these atmospheric clouds for so long had ideas about what's going on. But now that we're actually there and we are, you know, we've got Juno Juno spinning around it and making these passes and getting in and looking at different areas of the atmosphere and really digging into it, we're starting to find out so much more and it's amazing that juno is still going it was supposed to be like destroyed by radiation and crushed by magnetic fields long ago so this is pretty cool lightning it's awesome very cool all right last quick story orb weaver spider webs might contain neurotoxins of course of course (laughs) already the most terrifying spiders in my opinion (laughs) Might as well throw that on there. (laughs) (laughs) I love orb spiders. You know, the way the dew glistens off their beautiful orbish web. The way they build a new spider web every morning. So it's extra see-through. So you walk right into it. The fact that they love to make them right at face level. Yes. Yes. It's all great. This, This story specifically spoke to me today as last night. As I was... Pulling toilet paper off of a roll, a spider scooted out from between the sheets of toilet paper in my toilet paper roll. And yeah, anyway. Hi, bud. No thanks. (laughs) That that, that toilet paper roll. Yeah, not exactly where you would (laughs) expect. No, No, but anyway, yes, you think you walk through a spider web and you're like, no big deal. But maybe it's just because you're really big. Uh, This week, a reporter, Christy Wilcox, reports on a paper that reports neurotoxin-like compounds in the silk glands of banana spiders. And these neurotoxin-like compounds might allow them to weave webs of doom for their prey. (laughs) There are many tales of uh, researchers who are interested in these spiders or the general class of orb spiders and uh, how they're Prey, even before being bitten by the spider, tend to show some listlessness or symptoms of what you would expect from neurotoxin poisoning. And that's what led to this direction Hmm. of inquiry are these kind of symptoms that the prey species were exhibiting. And they've found that in other species nests, when they've rinsed the webs and then exposed prey species to the the uh, stuff that comes off of the webs in solution, that it's caused neurotoxic uh, effects. Um, so we think that maybe it's a general thing that all orb spiders might be capable of putting neurotoxins in their webs. And wouldn't that be helpful if you've got a prey? Mm-hmm 
item that's across the web from you. Yeah, you don't want them struggling so down. hard. They yeah. might pop Slow off. it down. Yeah. Or, or they could even be dangerous to you. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. some considerations there when you next walk through an orb spider's web. Or the next time you rewatch Lord of the Rings. Oh, yeah. Oh, dear. Yes. <laughs> oh, good point. Very good point. If you just tuned in, you are listening to This Week in Science. If you're interested in a Twist t-shirt or mug or other item of Twist merchandise, head on over to twist.org and click on our Zazzle link to browse our store and support Twist. We have face masks, too. Yeah, we do have face masks. (laughs) All right, time for the interview. Tonight, we are joined by Dr. Lydia Green. Dr. Green is an NSF postdoctoral fellow in biology in the Nicholas School of the Environment at Duke University, working at the Duke Lemur Center, studying the ecology of Madagascar's lemurs by looking at their poop. Welcome to the show. Thank you for Thanks for having me. It's great to get to talk to you. I came across you on Instagram and your Instagram account at lemur scientist. And I was just smitten by all the lemur photos that you're amazing. <laughs> the, the animals are amazing. The photos don't do them justice, but we try as much as we can to highlight them. Yeah, but they're amazing. You do you do you ask them to pose for you or is this no? <laughs> so the lemurs that we have here at the Duke Lemur Center are so used to having people around them and so they don't mind at all. They're like quite hams for the camera. Um, the lemurs in Madagascar are much harder to photograph because they're so much less habituated to people. And so from for those guys, it's usually a long lens and very blurry mm-hmm. and millions of horrible photos before you can find one that you can maybe can zoom in on. Um, so it's a real treat to see them up close um, at the lemur center. How did you get interested in lemurs? What led to your interest? Serendipity, I think. Um, I came to Duke as an undergrad after a sort of failed attempt at a professional ballet career. And I came to Duke for college just because it's where my mother thought I should apply. And I got in sort of miraculously, I think. Um, And I needed a work study job. And I went to the work study job fair. And there was like this table with this sort of lifestyle life-size stuffed shafak, which is a type of lemur on it, a stuffed animal that was like a my size. I was like, what is that? And they said, we're recruiting tour guides for the Duke Lemur Center. And I was like, the Duke Lemming Center? And they were like, no, Duke has lemurs. We have a center for lemurs. And I was like, ah, tell me more. Um, And so they were recruiting tour guides. And within my first week of college, I basically signed up as a work-study tour guide. And from there, it just kind of snowballed. So I started taking classes in anthropology. I joined a lemur-focused research lab. Um, I sort of began my own research projects. And it's just one of those things where you fall in love with these animals so quickly. And most of us never, never turn back um, into anything else again. So yeah, it's, it's sort of a, a black hole you fall into. Um, a great black hole. <laughs> Wonderful. It, sound, it sounds like it, it wouldn't be one you'd want to escape from. No. When yeah. I think of most how most people probably have interacted with lemurs, it's maybe at zoos or through nature documentaries. Um, and in specifically in nature documentaries, we see lots of behaviors that uh, people like David Attenborough tell us about and like make very special. But what about them fascinates you the most? So I think everyone's drawn at first to just the look of the animals. But when you sort of get steeped in lemur biology, the diversity of species, I think, is what really starts to become fascinating and the origin by which that diversity arose. So um, I'll take like a few minutes just to sort of get the basics of lemur sort of biogeography going. Um, But if you picture it 50 to 60 million years ago on Earth, um, when the dinosaurs start to go extinct or totally go extinct and mammals start to arise and primates start to evolve in mainland Africa, Madagascar had already been an island for like 30 million years. And so one of the biggest questions in lemur biology had always been how did lemurs get or early primates get from mainland Africa all the way over to Madagascar? And it turns out that the evidence points to um, a sort of early primate ancestor rafting across the Mozambique Channel from mainland Africa to Madagascar, a small colony of sort of pre-lemurs. And when they got to Madagascar, the small colony of lemurs 
stepped upon an island where there was a lot of open habitats, diverse habitats. There were no mammalian um, competition, no mammalian predators. And so these animals just sort of exploded in adaptive radiation. Um, and so from a small founding event to the 108 species that are extant on Madagascar today, as well as a bunch of species that have um, gone extinct. And so we just get this sort of enormous diversity of species that arose from this sort of crazy serendipitous event of lemurs getting to Madagascar in the first place. So when you start to sort of look at that story and unravel the sort of way by which these these creatures came to be, um, you become all the more fascinated by by the myriad different directions that the species sort of radiated into and, and how they carved out lives for themselves. I am fascinated by that, I guess, the way that the movement of Madagascar geologically, how that converged with the like the movement of the species mm -hmm. across oceans and then how it also created the ecosystems, the environments in Madagascar, which led to that diversification and how there's you're looking at time, geology, ecology, like all these pieces falling into place. It's yeah, we say Madagascar is sort of one of the greatest natural experiments that sort of Mother Nature has given us. So during Pangaea, Madagascar is the sort of sandwiched between India and Africa, and it's also attached to Antarctica a little bit. And as Pangaea starts to break up, Madagascar splits off first from mainland Africa, and then is attached to India for a while during the, the beginning of the journey across what is now called the Indian Ocean. And so Madagascar then separates from India about 80 to 90 million years ago. And at that point, Madagascar was quite far south. And so for the past sort of 80 to 90 million years, it's been isolated, but drifting farther north. And that northward migration also has big implications for the types of habitats that have been on Madagascar um, as, as lemurs arrived, and then also as the other mammals arrived, because we think there were three other rafting events that brought over the rodents, the tenrex, and the carnivores as well. So this, it, you're exactly right. This interplay of, of geology, of ecology, and of time um, becomes really critical in piecing together the story of, of Madagascar's mammals. They didn't all come and, over and then, on one big raft. No, we think that there were four rafting events. Genetic dating really um, points to there being four four di distinct rafting events, which is kind of crazy as well. So you can imagine lemurs lemurs get there first, and they were there for you know a number of million years before the carnivore showed up. And you can imagine the the lemur the first time it laid eyes on this carnivore that had just arrived, you know, fresh on fresh on shore, and was like chasing it around, and it had never experienced anything like this in its history. Oh my gosh! And then there's there's also it's got to be for the you said 108 different uh, species that are there now. So yeah, one of the things days about, ago. One of the things about Madagascar is right. It's not just an island of a forest of one particular type. It's for an for just a kind of a somewhat small uh, body mass. It's actually got kind of a diverse uh, set of biomes to it. Yeah, so Madagascar is famous for having a real diversity of landscapes. And so you've got like rainforest in the east, you've got a central high plateau that has endemic grasslands. You also have western dry deciduous forest, and then you have a southern spiny desert. But then within each of those ecosystems, you also have sort of micro habitats and you have pockets of micro endemism. So even within the rainforest, you don't get the same assemblages of species in the southern tip that you would get in the north. So you have this crazy, crazy micro endemism. And I guess the mouse lemurs are one of the best examples of this, that these tiny little primates, we now recognize 25 species all over the island of Madagascar. And so each one has its own little habitat that it lives in. So yeah, it's it, it's mind blowing actually how much how much micro endemism and, and the lemurs are an example of that. But a lot of the herps and the birds and the mam and the micro mammals also show this kind of crazy speciation. And it's just there's because there's so, so many diverse, the, the ecosystem is so rich, there's so many different it's like somebody chopped up Madagascar and said, be everything. <laughs> yeah. And there's a there's a number of theories to explain sort of why you get these pockets of endemism. And the one that I'm most familiar with has to do with watersheds and rivers. Um, and so in some of these areas, you get almost sort of like parallel rivers and different groups of species will live within the boundaries of the rivers. Um, and mm. so the rivers actually provide the the natural boundary that that differentiates species, which is kind of cool. So you just cross the river and you might find different lemur species all of a sudden. That's amazing. So that gets at the, you know, there's uh, the the idea in speci speciation of when is it actually a distinct species as opposed to a subspecies and when can um when can cross breeding take place? Is it, mm -hmm. is it reproductively isolated or is it geographically isolated? Do you know for the species in Madagascar how there are diurnal daytime 
lemurs and nighttime lemurs. So those are going to be separated by time. But it, what is there? What is there separating the, the the lemurs? Do you know? Well, I will also point out that there are cathemeral lemurs as well. So that's an activity Cathem- pattern. Cathemeral? Cathemeral. So that's cathemeral. an activity I haven't pattern. Heard this one. <laughs> yeah. So you can be awake um, basically at any time. And so we see this in a lot of the species of brown lemur, like the blue-eyed blacks and other ones um, that you can find at a lot of zoos around. And so what this means is they can be awake either, they can either do nocturnal or diurnal lives and they can change throughout the year. And so often what you'll see is when it's really, really hot, they'll choose to be awake at night when it's cooler to forage and doesn't waste as much energy. And then when it's cooler, they'll choose to forage during the day. Um, so you get this seasonal pattern to that activity, which is really, really cool. So yeah, you have diurnal, nocturnal, and cathemeral species. Yeah, Madagascar is crazy. That's my, that's my word of the day, cathemeral. <laughs> but to the, the bigger question of maintaining sort of species diversity, that brings in sort of the concept of niche differentiation. Um, so we do have 108 species all 108 don't live in the same forest at the same time. But these 108 species basically stem from 15 groups, 15 genera. And so in many habitats within Madagascar, you'll have representatives from most of those genera often living sympatrically, but you more rarely have multiple members from the same lineage living in sympatry. So the shafaks are a great example of that. There's nine species of shafak and no two species lives in the same habitat at the same time. Hmm. So you have three different rainforest specialists, you have four different and dry forest specialists, but none of them ever meet. So every forest you go to, you can sort of find a different a different assemblage of species, but you'll be able to recognize like, oh, that's a brown lemur. Oh, that's a shafak. Oh, that's a mouse lemur, but it might be a different species. That is that's fascinating. It's so at, at my zoo in our lemur exhibit, we have seven different species in one forest and we have the um, the black and white roughs that hang out at the very tip top of the trees. Mm-hmm. And we have the ring-tailed lemurs that are like the ground lemurs. They're always down on the ground and the crown lemurs are kind of in the middle. And so it's it seems like that's how it kind of works in Madagascar as well. Right. So you have this temporal differentiation where you can sort of be diurnal, nocturnal, cathemeral. You have this sort of uh, strata differentiation where you exactly right. You have rough lemurs up in the canopy and ring-tailed lemurs being more terrestrial, although those two species wouldn't ever meet in Madagascar. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you also have differentiation by diet. So you've got leaf-eating lemurs, fruit-eating lemurs, mo- lemurs that are more insecti- insectivorous, lemurs that are more specialized, more generalized. So you can differentiate by diet. Um, so there's so many different ways that these animals differentiate within, within their habitats. And that's why why these habitats can really support this, this diverse array of species. And on that mention of diet, diet leads to poop. And so can you tell us a bit about uh, what you're studying specifically and, and why you're looking at it? Yeah, so I study the gut microbiome of lemurs, which means I do need to collect a lot of poop. Um, and luckily, lemurs provide bountiful samples for me. Um, so it's it's a nice research area because it's so productive. Basically, what I'm really interested in is understanding how this gut microbiome relates to the diet of the animals and ha- whether that diet is across species. So comparing a leaf eater to a fruit eater to an insectivore, but also comparing things like how within a species, seasonal change in environment will change the microbiome, how changes in habitat quality or landscape might reflect be reflected in different microbiomes, um, and all those sorts of variables that are related to diet. So most of my work is basically following around lemurs with tubes and waiting for them to finish their morning coffee and then collecting samples non-invasively. So all of my work is is non-invasive and hands-off, which is really nice as well. Um, And then for the microbiome, usually what I do is sequence a marker gene that is common to all bacteria and archaea. And that gene allows us to figure out which microbes live in which samples and at what relative abundance. And then we can piece back together which inhabitants were there and at what time. And that can really help us figure out how how these microbes are adapting to, to different diets and, and within these different host systems. What kind of microbial populations, like what what is what is normal or the, I mean, with the diversity of different diets, more insect eaters, plant eaters, fruit, 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 fruitivores. Fruitivore, um, yeah. yeah. Fruitivores, yes. I almost went fruitarian and I said, no, that's not right. It works. <laughs> what kind of divergence do you see in the microbial gut? populations. Is there a big difference? 
Yeah. So what we're sort of piecing together in Madagascar is the same way we were talking about these assemblages of species is that within a habitat, you'll have many representatives from different lineages. And it's become clear that the microbiome relates to your lineage. So a shafak living in a dry forest is going to have a microbiome that looks more like a shafak from a rainforest than it will from a brown lemur that lives in its habitat. So you have these clear oh, patterns by the type of lemur, but then within mm-hmm. these lineages, you have clear structuring by the type of habitat that they live in, by the diet that they're eating. Um, so you have sort of multiple layers of different patterns that we could compare. And we even find fun things like for four lemur species living in the same habitat, so they're sympatric and they're all leaf eaters, but they eat slightly different leaf-based diets, we can see really, really clear signatures in their gut microbiomes that might help them survive on those sort of very, very different diets, but within this dietary category. So there's a, there's a lot to play with. What are you going to do with the understanding of the micro microbiome? I mean, it, I can I can see understanding how to feed the captive lemurs better, but is there more beyond that? Yeah. So a big one is understanding how we can help keep our animals healthy and well in captivity and understanding um, diets and nutrition and things like that. I think from an evolutionary perspective, I'm really fascinated by understanding the sort of symbiotic relationship between animals and their microbes and this idea that microbes allow us to do things that we couldn't do on our own. Microbes have this incredible wealth of metabolic capacity that we as as eukaryotes don't have. And so there's a lot of functions that our microbes confer on us and different animals end up getting different functions based on which microbes they have. And so microbes can enable leaf eating. They can enable enable living in in particular areas or at particular times or eating different diets. And so understanding how microbes underlie specialization, ability to adapt, I think that's a really, really fun place to be in science right now. And I do think it has conservation implications because if we want to understand why certain species are more susceptible to habitat loss and climate change, microbes might be part of that answer if microbes are really what are enabling animals to do certain things. You no, know, there, there might even be like a little bit of a a, a biotech aspect to this too. And I was, I remember this a while ago. We were, we had a, a story where there were, it was, I think forty uh, gut microbes that were the same. Forty, maybe it was even eighty that were identical between uh, red pandas, uh, regular pandas, and a panda lemur, a bamboo eating uh, lemur. And yeah, and it also my friend Aaron. Uh, some of them ah. okay, and some of them were even like <laughs> apparently in termites, which is also eating yep. like a you know very rapid. And so you know you look so you start to look at something like this, and you can you get this idea like okay, well if we ever need to break down bamboo uh, as a biofuel or something like this, there maybe you look to these creatures and how they've been doing it as a diet. Uh, to find candidates for for creating the enzymes in, in order to do it, but also yeah, if if we you know as climate change tends to affect things, uh, knowing and if there's a plant that's not going to survive anymore, but you've got an idea of what we what would still grow and is closest closest to what their diet was before that their microbiome can handle. Uh, for maybe a relative who's eating it somewhere else on the island already, you know that becomes huge for conservation as well. Well, so to sort of think about Dr. Aaron McKenney, who wrote the the panda paper and the lemur paper that you're talking about, and sort of to invoke an, an Aaron McKenney sense here, what Aaron helped me think about when I was a graduate student, because she was a couple of years ahead of me, and we we collaborated on some of these lemur projects, is if you think about it, gut microbes have been around since the evolution of a one-way gut. The evolution of the gut system itself went hand in hand with the evolution of the gut microbiome. We've never had a gastrointestinal system that doesn't have microbes in it. Those two came together. And so there are definitely microbes that are shared basically across all of us because they were probably around when the gut first evolved and before we all diversified into the different species we see today. So there are definitely definitely bugs in our our microbiomes that are consistent across lemurs, across chimps, across termites. Um, So things that pop up a lot like Prevotella, Bacteroides, and you see these microbes all over the literature and all over every sample. But then you do have these microbes that seem to be like species specific or diet specific. And those could be a really interesting place to play for looking at metabolic capacities that we don't yet know about. And again, this is where Madagascar, I think, becomes fascinating because it turns out that some of these lemurs have actually quite a lot of like unassigned taxa in their samples. They don't match against online databases that are mostly built from from human and model systems. And so some of these species of lemur, I blast their microbiome against these established online databases and like 30% of the microbiome comes back as like, no idea what that is. 
We don't know oh, what wow. that does. <laughs> and so who know who knows what untapped potential is in these these consortia in terms of what they're able to do. Yeah. That's, and and that's a fascinating and, and thing to think isolation about. and naming potential, right? Don't right. you get to name them all when you that's like that's just fun. That's just a blast then, right? Yeah, I don't Name see myself get- like culturing like trillions of bacteria for the rest of my career just for the naming rights, but but yeah. <laughs> oh, but just a couple of them, you know, as Christmas presents. <laughs> we know that in like koalas, they have a fecal transfer from, mm-hmm. the, from the mother to the offspring. Is there anything that like that in lemurs? Yep, coprophagy. Um, so that's the term for poop eating. And so we do see coprophagy, especially in infants and usually from moms. Mom, so it's not that unusual to see an infant just go up to mom and and we do think that that's a way that they're potentially seeding their microbiome. In some lemurs, there's an idea of what's called cecotrophy. So back up and give a little bit more context. So within the lemur gastrointestinal system, you have the intestines, but you also have the structure called a cecum. And in the human system, it's kind of what the appendix is. But in lemurs, this appendix is like fully blown out and really elaborate and complicated, and especially in the leaf eaters, because the cecum is the powerhouse site of microbial fermentation. So if you're a leaf eater, you basically shunt your leaves into your cecum where microbes attack it and turn it into nutrients for you. And so there's a suggestion in some of these leaf eating species that they actually excrete the digestive from their cecum and then they eat it again. And then by this point, the microbes have attacked it and have released all these nutrients in it. And so by re-eating it, you are really, really quickly able to absorb all of those, all of those nutrients much faster than you could otherwise. And so there's not only coprophagy, there's also this idea of cecotrophy in some species. So crazy question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you took one type of lemur as a baby and had it raised by another type of lemur, and then they ate that mom's poop, what would, would that mean that they could then shift their diet? No, I think is the, the big okay. take home. Okay. I think if you had a leaf eating lemur raised by a fruit eater and trying to eat the diet of a fruit eater, it would probably not survive very long. Mm-hmm. And this is because feeding strategy, which is what evolution tells you you should be eating and your diet usually match, right? So evolution says you should be a leaf eater. You've got shearing teeth, you've got the gastrointestinal system and the microbiome to support leaf fermentation. But if you go on to just eating fruit, the system wasn't designed to support that. And so it's probably not going to adapt very well. And I doubt we would ever get ethical permission to do that experiment right. anyway. Well, so the only the only real reason I'm asking Frostering. that question is that I know that, you know, Madagascar is kind of a limited space. It's an island. And there's a habitat destruction issues there. Mm-hmm. And so I'm just trying to imagine how you could push a population that lost its space into a new space that maybe required a different tactic or a different type of plant or something right. like that. So I think that's a fun idea to think about. But what I would say, especially for these leaf eaters, is that they and their microbiomes are so specialized on the diets in their micro habitat that they've evolved to eat. That this is a pretty specialized and co-specialized system that you can't just uproot and move it somewhere else. Um, and sort of a great example of that is the fact that most leaf eating lemurs do not survive in captivity. Most of the lemurs that you're going to see under human care are your omnivores and your fruit eaters. And it's really, really challenging to keep these species, these leaf eaters healthy under human care because they're so specialized on the specific diets that they eat. Um, and so things like translocations, moving animals around might be doable if you're moving them with sort of within the same habitat type, but you're not going to be able to transport a rainforest species into the dry forest and poof that's that's probably not going to work how well do uh different types of lemurs get along with each other yeah like, yeah. like with a different type like uh not within the group but uh with other groups because i don't know anything about i don't even know if they're like if they're more baboonish or bonoboish with themselves mm-hmm. or each other like i don't know where they <laughs> nope, fall I don't in do this baboons. Sort of, yeah no no i would stay away yeah they're, yeah, they're terrifying that, to me <laughs> yeah So there's sort of the question of how do lemurs respond when they meet other lemurs of their own species, but then how do lemurs respond when they meet lemurs of different species? And those are two completely different 
kettles of fish. Um, so lemurs do have territories, and so they do maintain their territories. Some species are more territorial than the uh, than others, but in general, when they come across uh, a conspecific, a member of their own species that's sort of invading their territory, they're not going to behave um, very kindly to that. But we often have the case where species will live really, really close to members of other species and not care at all. And so actually at the lemur center here in North Carolina, we have large forested enclosures where we can put multiple social groups of different species species into the same forested enclosure and they get along just fine. Um, but we but wouldn't if necessarily... You, yeah, you put in another one that matches one that's in there and then it's right. like mating competition problems all of a sudden. Now there's a reason to keep that group away from this group because they might steal my, my girlfriend lemur. Right. Um, and I won't <laughs> I won't go um, into like, there's a whole research area of animal friendships that I don't study at all. And I don't know much about it. But I will say I have seen in Madagascar cases where like you've got a brown lemur species and a shifox species that tend to hang out together. And so the guides will often say that the way they find the shifox is by first finding the red bellied lemurs. Um, hmm. And so I don't know if they they hang out because it's the right, the, it's the best tree and everybody wants the best tree, um, or if they're actually hanging out with each other for a particular reason, like, you know, predator avoidance or something like that. But yeah, you do, you do sometimes see these guys hanging out together and it makes you feel like, oh, even if it's <laughs> not what's really happening. <laughs> what have you enjoyed, enjoyed more uh, in, in searching for lemur poop, going to Madagascar and uh, searching in the wild or having it easier in the, in the lemur center, the Duke lemur center? <sighs> Yeah, there's definitely something really nice about working at the lemur center because you know you're going to get those samples. Like there's just no way you're not going to get that science done. And you can also sample them at a much more consistent and routine frequency than you could in Madagascar. Like I know I can watch Beatrice all day long and get every sample she excretes that day if I wanted to. So there's something really nice about having that kind of control over how often I can sample. But nothing beats seeing lemurs in Madagascar. Just nothing beats seeing them in the wild and the like hours you'll spend like staring at the forest floor, trying to tell like fecal pellet from leaf matter. Um, there's just nothing like that. It's like, it's a really wonderful experience. How many times have you been able to go? I think, I think seven. Amazing. Oh, wow. Yeah. So my wife is also a lemur biologist and she's been working in Madagascar for much longer. Um, and so I've gotten to to really learn from her and, and get to hang out on a lot of her field missions. But the longest I spent, we spent together in Madagascar was I think six months at one time. That's picking the right field. And the right wife. I, you could be. It yeah, is. Yeah. Because you could study be like, in, you know. An Arctic thing or a harsh desert environment or like something where it's like, oh, I've got to go into the field again. Oh, I've got to wear all this or keep drinking water all day. But oh, but you picked like one of the most beautiful places on Earth. That's well, it's not without challenge. Um, and so I think in hindsight, we tend to romanticize these experiences like, ah, oh, that time in the field Absolutely. is so nice. Madagascar is like a real challenge, especially in the rainforest. It is steep. It is full of leeches. It is like I fall oh. a lot. I rip my clothes all the time. Wait, Everybody leeches? laughs at me, including myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it can be it can be a real challenge just to hike into some of these areas to even see the lemurs. Um, so, yeah, I like run a lot here, not because I enjoy it, but because I just don't want to be that embarrassed in the field ever again, as I have been. So a lot of folks work in the dry forest because it's a lot flatter and a lot easier although it's like incredibly hot and dry there. So yeah, it's, it's beautiful and wonderful, but it's, it is not without challenge. And especially if you're someone like Marina, um, Marina Blanco, my, my wife, she works on the nocturnal animals and tracking those guys is a whole other like oh. drama. You tap out, you, you're done with a day, tap out, she goes out for the night. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, see you later. So yeah, I mean, trying to follow a mouse lemur around, you know, it's way 60 grams in the dark, exactly. And the rainforest is pouring um, and you're sort of hiking up hills. And yeah, I, I, I'll stick with the diurnals and the cathemerals. Yeah. That's a little bit better. That's another interesting aspect of ecological research that I've always been fascinated by is the uh, the bias of where researchers go and when they go and how yeah. it affects the data that we collect. Yes, hugely yes. And for the microbiome field, one of the things that excites me is that we might by using fecal samples, which we can collect non-invasively and from anything that poops, which is basically everything, we can actually level that playing field in terms of who we're studying. Um, so a lot of the problem in things like 
characterizing what animals are eating means that you have to rely on animals that permit you watching them. And so a lot of our information about animal diets comes from well-habituated populations that have been studied for a really long time that often live in well-protected areas. And so we don't have nearly as good of an idea of what some of these sort of more at-risk populations might be doing or might be eating because they're scared of people. Something like microbiome science, where we could use feces to actually reconstruct diets, either using microbiome sequencing or other types of sequencing, would enable us to really study more animals um, and and sort of get rid of some of that bias that has been that has been traditional. What kind of outlook is there currently considering um, climate change and deforestation and um, and, you know, other human impacts on on the environment and lemurs? This really sort of sobering thought about climate change is that the future of lemurs in Madagascar is so dire that it, climate change might not actually become the principal threat. Um, some of these species are projected to potentially go extirpated in terms of populations or extinct in like really the, the sort of near future. Um, and so a lot of us are much more focused on deforestation rather than sort of the, the, the less long term but less immediate effects of climate change. Um, so deforestation is a really big problem in Madagascar. Um, lemurs obviously need the forest to live. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty scary. Um, we just recently, um, I, was, I just was able to attend the IUCN red listing workshop for lemurs. We just recharacterized the threat assessment for all 107, now 108 species of lemur. And so many species were uplisted um, to a higher threat category based on, on burning that's been happening, particularly in the West. It's a scary time to be, I think, a lemur researcher, but it's also exciting to sit at that interface of where research-based conservation could actually come into play um, to think about how we can use research tools to inform, inform conservation action. Um, it's sort of, a, sort of um, an exciting place to be. Yeah, how we, how you can go in and collaborate with the local communities to find ways to enact conservation, to find ways to make it say, this is in your best interest, too. How can we work together? And I think even n- not beyond local communities, but in addition to working with local communities, what gets me really sort of hopeful is being able to work with Malagasy scientists and mm-hmm. see the enthusiasm um for, for, for conservation and for science um, among my Malagasy colleagues um, and being able to have, you know, all of our perspectives as part of a team is a, is a really exciting place to be. So part of the, part of the reason I love working in Madagascar is getting to, getting to share that science with our Malagasy colleagues. Is there anything that you think people really need to know about lemurs? I think getting to appreciate the diversity of species is really um, something that not a lot of people think about immediately. A lot of people think of like ring-tailed lemurs or rough lemurs, um, because it turns out that actually we have not that many species that are living in captivity. And so if you really start to look at all the species that live in Madagascar, you're going to see a wealth of diversity that you wouldn't get to see just by going to your local zoo. But definitely go visit and support your local AZA accredited zoo. But just getting familiar with all of these species that you'll never see unless you go to Madagascar. So things like sportive lemurs and woolly lemurs and the injury, um, all of these different types of dwarf lemur, fork marked lemurs, the hairy eared dwarf lemur. There are all these species that, that you wouldn't know about. Um, so make sure you, you really appreciate the diversity that's out there. And the dwarf lemurs, they're really interesting because they hibernate. Yes. Right. They are the only primates that hibernate obligately. So every dwarf lemur of every species and every habitat hibernates every year. Have to. They have genes, to. Genes say sleep. Mm-hmm. Well, so or, or that's an interesting ish. question Go because dormant. in in captivity, um, especially in the earlier years before they realized that they were hibernating in the wild, um, they wouldn't necessarily have the environmental conditions that would promote hibernation. So it's definitely a combination of, of your genetic machinery, but also the environmental conditions that trigger hibernation. Um, and I should probably tell you to let Marina talk about this at some point because this is really yeah. her area of expertise. Um, so I can sort of be a bad mouthpiece for hibernation hibernation in, in dwarf lemurs. It was known for like a long time that these guys would, would go through seasonal fattening um, and seasonal weight loss and that they would become sort of sluggish, but that you need to have the right environmental conditions at the right time to really trigger um, them to go into hibernation. But in Madagascar, they all hibernate. Have you collaborated at all on the microbiome of the dwarf lemurs? And we that we are doing that right now. And actually, we were going to submit a sequencing run before the coronavirus pandemic inhibited us from doing lab work. But we've been collecting samples from active and hibernating dwarf lemurs, both here at the Duke Lemur Center and also their wild counterparts in Madagascar, because there was this fascinating paper that came out in bears who also hibernate. And what the researchers did was they collected 
poop from active and hibernating bears. And then they took that poop and they showed that there were microbiome differences, but they transplanted those fecal samples into germ-free mice. So they gave mice the microbiome of an active bear versus a hibernating bear. Yes. And the mice, the mice that had the active bear microbiomes actually got fatter and gained more weight on the same diet than did the mice that had the hibernating bear microbiome. So the conclusion of this paper was that the microbiome is part of the machinery that helps you get ready for hibernation, mm -hmm. helps you deposit fat in order to be able to hibernate. And this, for anyone that studied hibernating animals, was like, oh my God, I wonder if this is what's happening. So there are also yeah. groups studying squirrels and on all sorts of Arctic hibernators as well. So we are, we are working on it. Oh, I can't, yeah. wait to, I can't wait to hear the results of that. I hope that I let's yeah. get the labs back up again, everybody, slowly but surely. Things will yeah. go back to normal eventually. Especially yeah. a sequencing lab. You could send one person to go work with some liquid handlers. That's all they really need. And then they can be fine. PCR machine. That's it. That's that's one person can go into the lab and take care of all that. Luckily, I don't actually do a lot of my own lab work. I send it to a national lab where they are much better at it than I would be. So I do the, mm -hmm. the first preliminary steps and then I ship everything off and rely on experts um to do a lot of that pcr prep yeah. my um, thing is a very lonely job they should have that that should be going constantly there's no need to shut that down yeah when i entered graduate school my phd advisor said to me like you have to figure out how you want to spend your time because you can't be good at everything do you want to be a field rat or a lab rat and where do you want to focus your energy and i was like i want to be a field rat yeah it's good to know sure. the lab skills so that you're you're you know them but yeah yep. yeah it's hard to do all the things where can people find you and find out more about the Duke Lemur Center as well? So you can check out our website, lemur.duke.edu. You can also just look up the Duke Lemur Center on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, and on YouTube. There's a ton of information and a ton of content out there. You can follow me on Instagram at lemur scientist. Um, but definitely check out the Duke Lemur Center's Facebook, especially. They post like a ton of things like baby announcements and research updates and, and things like that. And there's a lot of amazing, amazing photographs and information there. I'm going to have to do that. Yeah, that'll be like I the rest of your tour. night. Can baby we go get a tour once the so world's do, back to normal? <laughs> yes. Once the tours are back open, you can definitely come for a tour. I My stats might be a bit rusty, but I think it's usually like 30,000 visitors a year come wow. to tour the Lemur Center. Um, so we do have a full comprehensive education program, program that runs. And we're moving all of that to virtual right now. So there's a lot of virtual content oh, that's also that's posted great. on our social media. <laughs> and I understand that there's somebody will be somebody wandering around in a full body lemur costume. Yep. Yeah, we have a full lemur mascot um, that you do see so, uh, around campus um, occasionally. So. Yeah, I luckily do not have to wear that. <laughs> I'm very short, oh, so yeah. I don't, I'm not. Yeah, but that's it. too you know, quite, that's too bad because I would have let because because then the lemur could have been uh, busting out the ballet moves. <laughs> right. <laughs> they do call the Shafox dancing lemurs. Yeah. <laughs> mm. I, have you done dance your PhD? I considered it. And then I realized that that was a rabbit hole from which I would never return and that I would spend a lot of time like choreographing it. And that I, yeah, I just, yeah, I, I just left it, left, let it be. Mm -hmm. Well, coronavirus. Maybe I can dance my postdoc. Dance your postdoc. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I would love to see it. The dancing Shafox. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It has just been wonderful talking with you. About lemurs. Oh, really thanks for having it. me. Yeah. It's been fun. Thank you. It has been fun. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week and have a great night. Bye, everybody. Thank you. You are listening to This Week in Science. Thank you for listening to Twist. You are the reason that we're able to do what we do every week, bringing you up to date and down to earth news and science views. That's right. And with your help, maybe, just maybe, we can continue to bring a more sane, maybe not completely sane, but at least a more sane perspective to a world full of misinformation. Head over to twist.org right now. Click on the Patreon link and choose your level of support. Be a part of bringing sanity and science to more people. Can't explain things. 
And we're back. You're listening to This Week in Science. Yes, we are. Oh, my goodness. Time for a COVID update. I do like this. I do like this COVID music. Yes. According to the Johns Hopkins COVID trackers, the U.S. remains number seven in terms of per capita daily incidence and number one in terms of total daily incidence. India Mm -hmm. is poised to surpass the United States should we begin to decline a little bit more. Also, the World Health Organization data suggests a global plateau for daily incidence is emerging, which that could be potentially good news. Um, Hopefully we are plateauing a bit for this wave. And now, in the midst of Shark Week, we find ourselves searching for that evil lurking just beyond sight and wondering if it's safe to go back in the water. I mean, really, whether or not we can send the kids back to school. Mm. Mm. Yes. Well, although they don't present with symptoms as often as adults, there's a study out. Looking at the viral load in various age groups with mild to moderate symptoms, not the most severe symptoms, but the ones that don't really show much symptoms. And they found that young kids often have as much, if not more, virus than adults. And this doesn't say anything about their ability to actually transmit the virus now, um, but they have a lot of virus. They have all the virus. They have lots of particles in there, so... Oh. Additionally, a separate study found that 10 to 20 year olds transmit virus as readily as adults. So this picture of kids as a viral Petri dish kind of still holds um, school not going to be this virus free place if it happens. <sighs> also, uh, two studies modeled different scenarios for returning kids to school. One in The Lancet found that in the United Kingdom, a substantial proportion of the symptomatic population would have to be tested regularly and up to like 80 percent of the population would have to be tested and contact tracing and isolation would have to be implemented and strictly followed if the schools are to reopen and not trigger a second wave. The second study in JAMA looked at college-age students and concluded that all students would have to be rigorously tested every two days to ensure safe campus reopenings. And this would cost about four hundred. But it takes more than two days to get your test results back. Sometimes. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Yeah. So they 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 looked at various of a right in in the JAMA models, uh, the different scenarios they looked at had tests with different amounts of sensitivity and specificity. So uh, differing amounts of false positives and false negatives. And they determined that you could have tests of up to like 70 percent sensitivity, but the specificity needed to be uh, like 99 percent. So one of the two measures needed to be incredibly accurate, uh, but you could go with kind of a rapid, less sensitive test um, that are more uh, or less expensive. But still, students would have to be tested every two days. And it would and the cost would end up being around four hundred seventy dollars per student per semester if you're looking at a cost of like ten to 10 to maybe $20 per test. So that we're talking cheap, not very, not, not the best tests, but um, yeah. I, and I'm just trying to imagine a college environment where you, unless it's a saliva test, you want to so, go in and get screened every two days. I, yeah. But wouldn't that put 30% of the students in isolation at all times? If it's 70%, I mean, like it's probably mm-hmm. that's t- terrible. And so the the being outdoors, the physically distance distancing from other people, wearing masks, these are all social distancing measures. These are all things that we're doing to reduce the spread of this virus. And so the ability of biz- businesses to reopen more normally, of schools to reopen, 
all of these things are contingent upon people continuing to follow the social distancing measures. We will not be able to open schools. We will not be able to get back to anything closer to normal unless people continue to wear a mask, physically distance, um, you know, and try and stay outside, really, <laughs> at this point. Winter is going to be interesting. This is that's all I have mm-hmm. to say about uh, where that's going to go for the time being. Um But my last story for our COVID update segment is lurking in our immune systems. This is, again, my, you know, this evil from Shark Week. No, not Shark Week. Nefarious. Nefarious. No, there's an ancient power that today is understood as a functional bridge between our innate and adaptive immune systems. It is this bridge between the responses from what we have since birth and then what we develop in our immune system, the adaptive immune system, as we encounter various uh, pathogens that allows an integrated host defense to pathogenic challenges. And while the proteins that comprise this what's called complement are nominally part of the innate immune system, they can be recruited by actions by antibodies. So the antibodies that get triggered can then recruit the the complement proteins and complement proteins then help boost the adaptive immune response. And according to a recent study, this is potentially how SARS-CoV-2 virus is taking advantage of our immune systems. Hmm. A recent survey of viruses discovered that coronaviruses tend to be mimics, like their molecular structure is similar to complement and coagulation proteins. What have we seen a lot of? Weird coagulation issues and weird inflammation issues in, uh, in COVID patients. Based on that, on these symptoms that we've seen and also this survey that found this kind of mimicry within coronaviruses. Um, Another group of researchers did a study in which they hypothesized that people who have hyperactive complement systems would be more likely to have severe COVID-19. And so they published a a study this week in Nature Medicine that reports that people with age-related macular degeneration who have active, overactive complement systems are at increased risk of developing severe COVID-19. Exactly what they hypothesized. Wow. And so the finding suggests that the drugs that we have that work to inhibit complement mm-hmm. could have use in treating COVID-19. Interesting. So, yeah, so this really interesting logical path that researchers have been following to kind of dig into what is going on in this complex interaction between virus and immune system? If you just tuned in, you are listening to This Week in Science. Want to help twist? Leave a positive review for us today on your favorite podcast platform. All right, Justin, tell me a story. Uh, okay, so this is a drug candidate that has been developed by Salk researchers uh, that was previously uh, shown to slow aging in brain cells. By itself, pretty awesome. Uh, but now they've successfully reversed memory loss in a mouse model where the mouse were uh, uh, engineered to have inherited Alzheimer's disease. So this research, which was published online in the journal Redux Biology, uh, also revealed that the drug, which is called CMS-121 at this point, works by changing how the brain metabolizes lipids. This is Cody voice of Pamela Mayer, who's the senior staff scientist at the lab of Salk professor David Schubert, who and is also the uh, senior author of this paper. This was a more rigorous test of how well this compound would work in a therapeutic setting than our previous studies on it. Based on the success of this study, we're now beginning to pursue clinical trials. So this is a molecule that is reversing Memory loss. So basically what they did is they had, uh, these were uh, nine-month-old mice 
which they uh, claim is the or, or uses a model of equivalency to middle aged people. And these mice are beginning to show some deterioration, some memory problems. And it's they kind of liken it to the point when somebody might go in to do some cognitive testing because they've been having like an increased cognitive problems in their life. Maybe they know they have Alzheimer's in the family. Maybe they don't. Uh, but it's enough for somebody to maybe go to the doctor to get themselves checked out. So that's when they began the treatment uh, at this nine month point. They the it lasted three months. So the now 12 month old mice, uh, both treated and uh, they had untreated ones, were given a battery of memory and behavior tests in both types of tests. Mice with the Alzheimer's like disease that had received the drug performed equally well as the healthy control group animals, while the untreated mice uh, progressed in their uh, disease poor performance uh, on the test. That's pretty significant. This is uh, this is not this has not been an easy disease to uh, to treat, let alone, uh, you know, there have been plenty of things that have attempted to just sort of hold where you are. But this one was doing a, a reversal. This one removed cognitive impairment from mice that were already experiencing it. Yeah, so in this, they discovered that when it came to the levels of lipids, fatty molecules that play some uh, key roles and cells throughout the body, mice with the disease had several differences compared to healthy mice and those who had been treated uh, with the drug. In particular, researchers pinpointed differences in something known as lipid preoxidation, which is the degradation of lipids that produce free radical molecules that can then go on to cause cell damage. Mice with the Alzheimer's-like disease had higher levels of lipid preoxidization than either healthy mice or those that had been treated with the CMS-121. Quoting voice again, uh, this is, oh, this is a postdoctoral fellow, uh, Games Attis, who's the first author of the new, part, uh, new paper. That not only confirmed that lipid preoxidation is altered in Alzheimer's, but that this drug is actually normalizing those changes. Uh, they went on to also show that the drug lowers levels of a lipid producing molecule called fatty acid synthase fasten, which in turn lowered levels of lipid preoxidation itself. When the group analyzed the levels of fasten in brain samples from human patients who had died of Alzheimer's, they found patients had higher amounts of the fatty acid synth uh, synthase protein than similarly aged control groups who were cognitively healthy, which suggests. This is why we have mouse models. This is the this is the which suggests that the the uh, the fasten could be used as a drug for treating Alzheimer's disease. Other groups, well, while the uh, group in uh, is pursuing the clinical trials, they hope other researchers will explore additional compounds that may also be treated by attacking fasten and lipid preoxidation. They've got a drug. They've got they've got targets, mm -hmm. and it works in mice. So. Yep. Fingers crossed it actually works in people. <laughs> yeah. And I like that. There's a, this is Mayo again. Uh, she said, there's a, there has been a big struggle in the field right now to find targets to even go after. So identifying a new target in an unbiased way like this is really exciting and opens lots of doors. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's one yeah. thing to open a door and have a, a path to a potential uh, as we usually hear in, in these early stage uh, attempts to tackle a disease. But extremely exciting to have already had at least a mouse model example of it, uh, it operating, uh, having chased down from, from looking at other patients, having chased down where you think you might be a, a good target and having it work is a little bit further down the path than uh, often we're even talking about. And, it, and the treatment of these diseases. So uh, beyond a correlation, we have a drug that a molecule that seems to have impacted positively and now having, you know, what they're basically saying, too, is, hey, we did something that kind of worked here. Everybody else should steal this idea right now and attack here and see if yep. you can do it better than we can, because we just want to get this disease off the plate. We're not yep. let's fix trying it. to corner. Let's fix it. <laughs> just, let's get this done. Fix it. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Speaking of fixing things, there's a, a study looking at multiple sclerosis. Researchers say they have found the holy grail. And now whenever, you know, it's, that's 
you know, it's sensationalist. A buzzword for sure. it's, yeah. it's buzzword. It's sensational yeah, speaking. It's, but it's, researchers at the University of Edinburgh worked on finding uh, finding a way to help protect nerves in multiple sclerosis. In multiple sclerosis, there's a process called demyelination in which the myelin sheath around the axons of nerves is damaged. And when that damage happens, it affects nerve transmission, makes it less efficient. And then also the axons then shrink and wither away. They basically become less and less and less able to function once that uh, once that myelin sheath is gone. So the researchers were looking for mechanisms within the body that of people who don't have MS, the cellular, the cells around neurons that work to protect and to support myelin sheaths. And so they have found something that they call ARMD, axonal response of mitochondria to demyelination. What happens is in in normal situations when myelin is damaged and no multiple sclerosis is present, mitochondria are activated to travel to that area of damage. Mitochondria being the energy powerhouse of the cell then are able to energetically support the processes of repair and support the axon of the nerve that it's that 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 glial myelin is a glial cell um, and that the myelin is protecting. And so uh, this is something that happens regularly. But when multiple sclerosis is in play, it's not enough. The the ARMD, the armed can't act enough to maintain the the axons it just the deterioration just continues to occur and so they thought what if we could enhance this axonal response of mitochondria to demyelin and demyelination and so they targeted mitochondrial biogenesis mitochondrial transport and they ended up finding a drug that is a commonly used readily available diabetes drug that yeah. does this and wow. in uh in their uh their mouse model that they that they studied that they tried all this out in they were able to show a uh, reversal of demyelination in wow. uh in a, in a mouse model of multiple sclerosis when given this diabetes drug so uh, wow. it is one of the first times that a drug and potentially a manner of protecting the nerves has been developed for multiple sclerosis. And so similar to what you were talking about with the Alzheimer's study, where this is a target, this mm -hmm. is now a mechanistic process within the myelin that can be targeted by, say, this drug that they found, or are there other better ways to activate those mitochondria to support. Yeah. yeah. So this is a, cu a couple of really interesting discoveries for some very big, uh, very big diseases that affect a lot of people. So I like to think, you know, we we're talking about COVID where earlier in the COVID update, it's a little depressing, but there's some hope out there. People are still working on some really big solutions. Um, but if you are trying to maybe someday hope that your brain will work like, uh, you know, did you see that movie Limit Limitless where there's a drug and you could take a drug and your brain, its capacity was limitless. You could Well, do it was it. all based on the idea that that's not really true, right? That you only use like 10 percent of your brain or something. Right. Right. What we use all of our brain, but yeah. <laughs> we don't necessarily use every bit of it all at the same time. And this study that was just released out of the University College London was looking at the energy demands of the brain and the really they're trying to figure out how attention, uh, how when we have um, when you're focusing on something. And because you're focusing on something, you 
are not able to pay attention to other things, how your atten- how focusing your attention kind of limits your ability to pay attention to everything. Well, maybe for you. <laughs> no, I can walk the class pretty Fine. darn well. But, no, but if I'm reading something, I sometimes can't hear. Somebody can be talking to me and I don't even know that they're talking to me because uh, reading shuts everything else out. Yeah. Uh, whereas I can carry on a conversation audibly with like three people and be listening to the uh, fourth table. Not a problem. But if I'm reading, it just becomes tunnel vision. Yeah. And so why does this happen? Why aren't we able to maximize processing? And what is the limit to this processing power of the brain? So there there are their study that was published in the Journal of Neuroscience. They uh, were basically looking at this idea of how much energy it takes to run the human brain. And the senior author, Professor Nili Lavi, says, we know that the brain constantly uses around 20 percent of our metabolic energy, even while we rest our mind. And yet it's widely believed that this constant but limited supply of energy does not increase when there's more for our mind to process. So our mind is just we're at this 20 percent. It's just we're not taking any more energy from the body. That's just kind of what we've got. And so they wanted to see how the body was basically divvying up that energy during different situations. They used a new method of non-invasive optical imaging that they've developed at the University College London, in which they use a broadband near-infrared spectroscopy to measure oxidation levels of an enzyme that's involved in energy metabolism in the mitochondria in the brain. So most fMRI looks at blood oxygen levels and it's this, uh, it's a, it's not an exact measurement because it's a, it's, it's a, it's a parameter that can be measured that like, oh, well, if oxygen's being used, then the brain's using energy, right? Some kind of activity. Right. Some kind of activity, but we don't know what that oxygen really is an indicator of. Um, And this is more specific in that it's actually measuring energy use in the mitochondria. And uh, so using this technique and looking at the brains, the visual visual cortex of about 18 people, they uh, gave them tasks where they increased the difficulty of the task and then had them pay attention to different things. So basically asked them to have singular focus and then tried to distract them and uh, or tried to get them to multitask on things and look to see how the brain allocated energy and they say that uh that really what they're what they're finding is that the brain is going to fail to process some information because it it just is taking that 20 percent and it goes okay you're focusing on reading right now that is where the energy is going to be and the energy that would normally go to other brain areas that are uh in uh, more for hearing or I mean, they're only looking at the visual cortex in this particular mm-hmm. particular instance, but looking at other aspects of visual processing, um, they uh, they found that the brain down regulated the amount of energy that was being used in those areas. So really less energy processing, less nerve activity in areas that are not doing the work. Mm-hmm. Um They say uh, the last quote from this article is during recent months, we've heard from a lot of people who say they're feeling overwhelmed with constant news updates and new challenges to overcome. When your brain is at capacity, you are likely to fail to process some information. You might not even notice an important email come in because your child was speaking to you or you might miss the oven timer go off because you received an unexpected work call. Our findings may explain these often frustrating experiences of inattentional blindness or deafness. (laughs) <laughs> but there's a uh, overload and there's a hard limit on our brain capacity for processing according to this study. I like the I like the covid lens on that because I think there's a lot of conversation about the emotional toll that all of this yeah. takes and like come on it's a pandemic like people are emotionally strained. We are physically strained in our brain it turns out. Yeah. Our brain can only handle so much. Yeah. And, and that's something that, uh, yeah, potentially could be taken into account for, uh, you know, how much work people are are capable of, how how many tasks people are considered capable of. And, you know, as uh, work life balance is, mm-hmm. is struggled to get to define, um, you know, maybe work workplaces um, can take this into account. 
a little bit more. Yeah, and this is we've uh, we've covered this to some extent before, but this is uh, this is also uh, the effect of just being uh, poor, mm, uh, right? Because that's just being stress po- there. There's a constant stress uh, level, and uh, your if you all of your mental activity is focused on the task of just uh, having survival. enough to survive for the other, yeah, day. yeah you, you don't really have. Sometimes times to make uh, longer term plans or or um, really focus on things like pandemics and global warming or any of the issues that you might be interested in if you didn't have to just concentrate so much of your time, energy and stress on making ends meet. Do you know what time it is? What time is it? I think it's time for Blair's Animal Corner. Ah, with Blair. She loves our creature, bright and small. Five pet, little pet, no pet at all. Want to hear about animals? She's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. That are no closer. What you got, Blair? Well, I have a story about pandas tonight, tonight, but it's about how they're the worst. <laughs> At what now? Bad pandas. They're just the worst. The, wor- the worst. The worst pandas. Oh, yeah. worst. In every category. So let me explain. <laughs> uh, when you think about animal conservation, or when the average person thinks about animal conservation, what comes to mind? Of course, the panda. The panda is an extremely high-profile animal that... Lots of money and time and effort has gone to try to help save. And all in all, it's been pretty successful for the panda. They were removed from the International Union for the Conservation of Nature Endangered Species list. That's uh, what our guest mentioned before the IUCN red list. Um, In 2016, they're still vulnerable, but they were no longer listed as endangered. So that has worked. But critics like myself say... But we need to save more than just pandas. The response usually is that if you use a charismatic individual as the main kind of selling point for a conservation topic, then by saving that animal, you will inadvertently or in or in some cases intentionally also save other animals that live in that same habitat. And so that's been kind of the the reasoning behind panda conservation for a long time is even though, yes, they may be an evolutionary dead end and they always have an upset stomach and they're terrible at breeding and they get lost all the time and I could go on. They still make a good <laughs> focus for conservation because they are so charismatic, bring in money and therefore help save other animals that live in bamboo forests. Well, as I mentioned they're the worst. <laughs> this is this is a new study looking at other animals that are endangered in panda habitat and how their population has done since panda conservation has begun. So new research has found that leopards, snow leopards, wolves and doles, they're also called Asian wild dogs, have almost disappeared from giant panda habitats since the 1960s. They looked at survey data from the 1950s to 1970s with information from almost 8,000 camera traps taken between 2008 and 2018. So they had their survey data, then they had their camera traps. And they found that leopards had disappeared from 81% of giant panda reserves, snow leopards from 38%, wolves from 77%, and doles from 95%. Pandas are really bad. So oh. they they face a lot of the same problems as pandas. Pandas are, have problems with poaching, with wildlife trade, with habitat destruction. The predators face poachers, logging and disease. And the key challenge seems to be that pandas have a home range of about 13 square kilometers. That's about five square miles. But the large carnivores I mentioned can roam over 100 square kilometers in habitat. So the fact that they save these small little islands for the pandas kind of don't do squat for these other animal species. Yeah. 
So in the end, one of the lead researchers says they call for future conservation to see beyond a single species or animals with enormous charisma and instead focus on broader restoration of natural habitats, i.e. what I usually start yelling about on the show. (laughs) (sighs) Save habitats, not animals. But these also, I mean, this the territory is all in China. Mm-hmm. I'm surprised that there's any wild animals. For, just from the 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 activities of uh, Chinese, there were Chinese fishing boats off the Galapagos, like a fleet of them over the last couple of weeks that had to get chased off. Like, who knows what they were going after? But yeah, if you picked one animal, you say, okay, this is going to be. Uh, a controlled thing that's a publicity thing. We'll send it to zoos. We'll lend it out for a million dollars a visit or whatever the thing mm-hmm. is. Uh, yeah, that's it's became a commodity. And I don't think it's ever been a conservation effort really for anything beyond anything beyond a commercial enterprise. So uh, I, I think uh, conservationists would disagree with you. There are huge projects working on establishing these protected spaces. There's breeding mm-hmm. efforts where they release pandas in the wild. We've talked mm-hmm. about studies on the show where they've done studies on um, animals that are born in captivity and if those pandas can thrive in the wild. And so there's actually there's a lot of good conservation work going on. My for argument is that it's for, for one, one animal, animal and an animal yeah. that I don't know if their niche is actually that important. They're not really good at surviving. Like, uh, maybe let's try for somebody else that could do a better job. Yeah. Save the bamboo forests, which is yeah, really right. So I was going to say, it's like, uh, save the biome itself. This is exactly this is the, yeah. You say, okay, here's, here's this sort of biome that re- reaches from here to here. Here's the population of different animals that are there. We're just not going to let humans go there. That's yep, kind of protect the, them all. Yeah, that's so kind of the conservation. It's, I mean, and other animals have gone that way. If you look at orangutan conservation efforts, for example, it is 100% focused on saving rainforests. Mm-hmm. Okay. It is not focused on saving orangutans. They use the orangutan as like the poster child. Yeah, but all of the efforts are focused on saving that habitat, which of course the the rainforests are like the most biodiverse habitats on land on our planet. So good choice to save the rainforest. There's lots of animals that are going to benefit from that besides the orangutan. So it's a good, it's a good reminder that that's where, that's where to go from here with animal conservation. Thunder Beaver says charismatic is subjective. (laughs) <laughs> especially when it comes to the panda. So it is and it isn't. <laughs> I will say that uh, some studies I've looked at, look at what makes an animal charismatic or cute. Usually charisma has charisma. to do with cuteness. Cuteness. Right. Mm. And that's all based on um, in infantilism. Do they look like babies? Do they have little BB eyes, baby eyes? Do they look fuzzy? So the more they look like a puppy, Mm -hmm. the better they're likely to do. And pandas definitely look kind of cuddly. So I would not black around their eyes doesn't doesn't it 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 takes away from the fact that their eyes are beady little Mm -hmm. eyes. Mm -hmm. Makes them look big like a teddy bear. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, do you let's stop talking about pandas? Do you guys want okay. to talk about bugs Bad crawling pandas. out of frog butts? Because that's what I want to talk about. Yes, yes, I do. Um, now that so, you say it, you what? know, predators prey. That's all life is about, right? The rat race. Um, so prey can get away from predators a lot of ways. They can es- escape before they're eaten, but there are some that can escape afterwards. For example. Some animals can survive the digestive systems of predators and are excreted in feces and then they escape, but it takes a while. It's passive. Uh, I think we've talked about that on the show before too. There's like, um, there's larva that, that actually pass completely through before they're pooped out. But, uh, this is the first time we have seen a quick active escape. From the body of a predator after being eaten. 
This is from Kobe University. And uh, researchers found that the aquatic beetle Regimbartia attenuata can actively escape from the frog Pilophylax nigromaculatus. In their digestive Very well system. done. Well Thank done. You. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Phonetics. And where this comes from, how do you actively escape from the digestive system? Well, it is not enough to just crawl your way through. You must also get out at the end. Knock, knock, knock. Um, So frogs don't have teeth. A lot of the time they don't kill things before they eat it. So usually the digestive enzymes are the ones that kill the prey so they can swallow stuff whole. And so these beetles have to not only scoot through quick enough to not get eaten up by digestive enzymes, but they also have to be able to get out the last leg of the journey, as they uh, as you might say. Um, So (laughs) the sphincter muscle on the frog is the pressure keeps it closed. So the tiny beetles actually have to encourage the frog to open it. So they stimulate the frog's gut to promote excretion. This was true in this frog species and four other frog species that they tested this on in a lab. So how do they stimulate it to promote digestion? Um, I mean, is it like poke, 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 digest, poke, 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 or is it chemical stimulation? Like, what do they do? I do not believe they know yet. Or is it just like... What they do know is that if you chopped up the beetle and throw it into their body, it would take them um, over 24 hours to poop it out. But if if they were alive when they were swallowed, it would take uh, about... I think it's about four hours. It would take way wow. less. So, so the beetle itself being present at the back door, yes, uh, at the back exit, w- <laughs> would maybe be enough for the frog to be go- like, "Oh, it's not my usual time, but I guess I've got another one." Yeah, here we go. Let me mm-hmm. just take care of some more business. I mean, I wouldn't that mm-hmm. seem logical that it's just? It seems like yeah. it's ready. Again. Yeah. Oh no, go. that's definitely what it is. The frog. It's not like the frog's like, "What's happening to me?" No, they're they're going to poop for sure. That's that's part of the deal. But how? Yeah. yeah how exactly are they doing it? How is it encouraging this to happen? Oh, it's about six hours. It happens about six hours after they're eaten. So a quarter of the time. A quarter of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Um, and every single one that was excreted <sighs> within those six hours, alive and active. <sighs> So, okay, so many questions and so many thoughts here. Uh, Mostly, I mean, this is just taking me back to so many cartoons growing up where main characters end up in the whales, in the gut of the whale. Or, you know, I think there was a schoolhouse rock that talked about the the digestive system and they're inside the digestive system. You know, you end up in there and there's always this idea fiction though that you could get out Mm -hmm. but it's not fiction it is real yeah so this is (laughs) this is my question (laughs) the frog's not getting any nutrients from that beetle because it's not being broken down why would it keep eating these beetles why would it keep eating these beetles this is the question well to be fair it doesn't care it's just i want to eat anything no harm means it out if to be fair, if you eat oh. enough of them, it creates it creates uh, a, a line at the back, and then the ones at the back of the line end up getting digested. Would they though? I don't know if they would. I think so. I think eventually they'd all just, just conga out traffic. of there, like, make a nice conga <laughs> line. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> Uh, the da, gut da, escaping da, da, conga da, line. Da, 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 da. Hey, hey. <laughs> that's how they stimulate their way out. Oh yeah, oh, that's a that's it. a uh, that's a survival technique that I don't think I've come across before. Yeah, uh, so no. so this is totally no. This is totally We've new. Never this talked is, about this before. Yeah. No. This is as as far as we know the first study to report successful escape of prey insects from the vent of a predator, and from the um, vent that means yeah. the butt. That means the butt. 
the cloaca, yeah. the all in one hole, as yes. it were. Um, and that, uh, and this is the first where we've seen that they, they promote excretion to escape. So this is a whole new strategy out there that needs to be studied. How do they do it? How do they promote excretion? Why well, do the frogs the still first, eat them? And this is, yeah, so many questions, but this is the first time that they've seen it. So that in itself is how common is this? Mm -hmm. But the is fact just, that four other frogs, yeah. then four completely different species also did this with this beetle. We don't know. Yeah, this beetle's just, uh, it's tough. Mm -hmm. This is it's a tough, tough little beetle. beetle. <laughs> Eating me isn't gonna do nothing. Don't eat the worry. beetle. Yeah. There's some teeth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. What a fun story to end the wow. animal corner on. That was fantastic. We have one question for our This Week in Science questions. And we've talked about this a little bit kind of in passing, but um the email we got said, hope you folks are staying safe over there, both physically and mentally. We haven't had a case in our state for a couple of weeks now, so fingers crossed. <laughs> My question for Twists is that for the last six months, there's been a large increase in personal hygiene. From social distancing to hand washing to the use of sanitizer or just staying home, we've been exposed to less less pathogens and the drop in common diseases like influenza have been quite marked and measurable and people are still having babies maybe more than usual later in the year mm -hmm. hey lockdown was boring right mm -hmm. as you know the hygiene hypothesis is the idea that a decrease in exposure to microorganisms particularly in children leads to greater problems with allergies and immune diseases I know time will tell, but do you think we will see more problems in the upcoming months and years? Or will this be a worldwide experiment to disprove the theory? Kurt Larson. I think for me, I still have a dog, so I'm still exposed to a lot. <laughs> and you're still going outside. Yes. And, yeah. 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 I think I, the, I think that is the big big side of it is we're still going into the environment. You're still eating food. You're still getting groceries from various places. You are, if you have pets, maybe those pets are going outside, bringing things in. Um, perhaps you have children and they're in a small group, maybe not as large as they were. Um, so the hygiene hypothesis, I think really is more so um, like, absolute cleanliness and um this real avoidance of germs that that we've had as a society over years um with the idea that people in in rural areas are you know have le have fewer al allergies people who are who are exposed to cow pastures for instance have fewer allergies than people who grew up who, with animals right. or mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, yeah, but there is so. something to be said about washing your hands way more, which mm -hmm. we've learned really how often and how carefully we all washed our hands before, which is not great not news <laughs> if you're worried about disease, but maybe was good news if you're worried about this. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, think I think you're right, Kurt, though. I think it will be a good test. I think that you absolutely could see a potential of higher allergies uh, and and also people people getting a lot more cold. I, I think you could see people who haven't had as much exposure and have immune systems that are more likely to get colds. And I think those colds get, get a little tougher to deal with the older you get. I think it, and there's something about that that young immune system that can take on all these colds always have, you know, one line of snot coming out of one side of the nose <laughs> to the other and still be going about every activity as if nothing uh, was mm -hmm. happening. I don't, I, I think this is a blip and I don't think that it is as going to be as dramatic in terms mm -hmm. of the hygiene hypothesis and, and that effect of, uh, you know, leading to greater problems with immune systems and allergies. I think it'll just be, hey, you haven't been exposed to that coronavirus before or haven't been exposed to the flu before. And so it'll be your immune system not knowing how to fight some things off. And so I think that is just more likely, which is just normal functioning of the immune system. But we will see, won't we? Yeah, yeah. I, think, you, I think it could. 
get those higher ticks of allergies later on. I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. If you have a question for us, send me an email, Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com. You can also leave us a message on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash thisweekinscience. We'll do our best to answer. Whether we answer your question, that is to be debated. <laughs> Thank you for enjoying the show. We have come to the end of another show. We've done it. We've done it. Thank you to our guest tonight, Dr. Lydia Green, for joining us this evening. And remember, you can find out more about uh, Dr. Green's research. Follow her on Instagram at Lemur Scientist. Shout outs to Fada for his help with social media and show notes and trying to herd the cat show that is putting together this week in science gourd thank you for manning the chat room identity for thank you for re recording the show and i would like to thank our patreon sponsors and the burroughs welcome fund for their generous support thank you to john shioli eric combs flying out guillaume john lee ben rothig Ali Coffin, Maddie Perrin, Gaurav Sharma, Taylor P.S., Josiah Zayner, Mike Shoemaker, Sarah Forfar, Donald Mundus, Rodney Lewis, Stephen Alberon, John Ratnaswamy, Dave Friedel, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Corinne Benton, Sky Luke, Paul Runovich, Ben Bignell, Kevin Reardon, Noodles Jack, Sarah Chavis, Paul, Jason Olds, Brian Carrington, Matt Bass, Joshua Fury, Sh Sean and Nina, Sue Doster, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflo, Jean Tellier, Steve Leesman, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Richard, Brendan Minish, Melizond, Johnny Gridley, Richard Porter, Christopher Dreyer, Mark Mazaros, Artyom, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Robert, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Matt Sutter, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Mountain Sloth, Jim Drapeau, Alex Wilson, Dave Neighbor, Matthew Litwin, Eric Knapp, EO, Kevin Parachan, Al Aaron Luthan, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Disney, Patrick Pecoraro, Gary S., Ed Dyer, Tony Steele, Ulysses Adkins, Brian Condren, and Jason Roberts. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. If you are interested in supporting us on Patreon, you can find information at patreon.com slash This Week in Science on next week's show. We will be back Wednesday, 8 p.m., broadcasting live from our YouTube and Facebook channels and from twist.org slash live. Hey, do you want to listen to us as a podcast? Just search for This Week in Science wherever podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe, too. Maybe tell them that we talked about, you know, Beatles coming out of frogs. <laughs> You know, it'd be nice and fun. <laughs> For more information on anything you've heard here uh, today, show notes and links to stories will be available on our website, www.twist.org. And you can also sign up for our newsletter. That's right. Sent one out today, actually. Um, you can contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or Blair at blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, in the subject line so your email doesn't get spam filtered into oblivion. <laughs> You can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you tonight, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember. It's all in your head. <laughs> This week in science is the end of the world So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand Cause this week's science is coming your way so everybody listen to what I say I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's
it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer, and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just yet understand that we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy. 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 And this week in science is counting away. So everybody listen to everything we say. And if you use our method instead of rolling a die, we may rid the world of toxoplasma. God It's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 Got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way you better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 this week in science.